Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Rambus with Frank Furrow, who's going to talk today about memory architectures. Frank, we've seen a lot of changes in terms of the amount of data that's being generated. If you think about a car, for example, an autonomous vehicle, it's going to have streaming video coming in. The processors are set up to handle a fair amount of uh, data. They can move very quickly, but the memory is becoming a bottleneck again, right? Yeah, that's, that's right, Ed. So right now we see uh, applications, as you mentioned, automotive and uh, AI. There's just a, a number of applications where the current architectures for the processors are really the, the processing speed are outstripping this, the, uh, the memory bandwidth available to those processors. So SOC designers are looking at ways, how can we open up that memory bandwidth uh, with the existing architectures that we have? So there's a number of uh, memory systems that are in place today and uh, you know, most traditionally DDR has been used. But in order to, to get much more bandwidth, uh, architectures like HBM and GDDR are starting to really come into play and getting a lot of evaluation, a lot of attention. And Why don't you draw this out for us? What does a GDR uh, memory look like versus a high bandwidth memory? So what are we looking at here? So basically what we're looking at is uh, uh, memory system architectures that are giving you 256 gigabytes of system performance. So we've got here on the right hand side uh, an HBM system and you can see you've got your, your SOC and you've got one HBM DRAM that's running at 2 gigabits per second. So although the speed seems very, relatively slow, you've got 1024 bits. So HBM gives the uh, system a lot of bandwidth at a relatively low speed, which is nice from a system design standpoint. And so if you're working at 7 nanometers or 10 nanometers, your wires are going to get very thin if all you're doing is on-chip memory, right? Yeah, that's, that's correct. So you can see with 1,024 bits, this is really a 2.5D system. If I, if I drew this completely, you'd see uh, this all sitting on a, an interposer of sorts, and then that interposer would sit on the system. So the only way to route out 1,000 wires is through a, some type of silicon, to an AFD system. So the, the advantages of this is you get very high bandwidth. I think the, the um, challenges though is now you have to route a thousand signals and that, that calls for two and a half D technology. If we look on the other side, uh, we've got uh, the same uh, 256 gigabit memory system. The only difference is now we're doing this with GDDR6. And so you can see that in this case, I'm going to re it requires four GDDRs. They're running very fast, so you've got four, in this case, running at 16 gigabits per second. So that's 16 gigabits per pin. And that gives you the same exact you know, memory, capability, memory bandwidth capability for both systems. The difference here is you're using a much more traditional 2D uh, technology where you would put the DRAMs on the board just like you would with DDR. And so you've got, um, uh, and you're running at much higher speeds as well. So these are, uh, you've got you know, more signal integrity challenges with the GDDR. Does one use more power than the other? So yeah, the advantage, I think the advantage of, of HBM is certainly it's a much more power efficient system. You've got, a, you know, again, you're running the signals slower so that by uh, just inherent speed is going to give you better, better power performance. Although, the, you know, the power efficiency of, of GDDR is in the same range of DDR, it's just that you're running much faster. So your, your total power is going to be much higher. Uh, compared to HBM. Which one's more expensive and which one's more cost effective? So again, it really depends on the type of application. So it's it's not that one uh, memory system is better than the, another memory system. It's, it's really what's fitting your application. So in the case of HBM, we're seeing where you need very high bandwidth and you do have some flexibility on cost because as I mentioned, the 2 d interposer is going to is going to be much more expensive to manufacture. It's a relatively new manufacturing process to do 2.5D to this whole flow where you've got to uh, take the chip and then put it on the interposer and then mount that in a package. So that's a relatively uh, new process flow and it's going to be expensive until it, until it really can generate some volume. Uh, GDDR is going to be much more in your very traditional DDR manufacturing system. So again, as I mentioned, it's 2.5D. You do have some more PCB challenges because you're, you're you know, running these traces at very high speeds. But again, it's still in that same cost profile that most uh, companies are comfortable with. So a lot of this depends upon use case, and the, a lot of that is tied to the vertical uh, market that these go, go into. Which one is going where? Well, 
I think there's there's still some gray area, but I think there's some starting to see some very clear segmentation. So uh, for HBM, you're getting uh, applications like AI and crypto mining, where you just need lots of bandwidth. Uh, you don't necessarily are as cost sensitive. In the case of GDDR, we're seeing applications that are in fact more cost sensitive. You're looking at uh, non-traditional, uh, surprisingly, like network applications where you might use a, a mid-range router or even in some a wireless networking application, we're seeing GDDR used as, a, as an alternative memory system. So again, I, the trade-off is really about uh, the, the absolute performance and bandwidth you need, cost, and then the, uh, you know, the speed of the memory system. Is it the cost just of the memory, or is it the whole architecture that's more expensive? Yeah, it, it, it's the, the cost is of the whole entire system. So again, in the case of HBM, you've got you've got to look at the interposed with manufacturing, the yield. In the case of GDDR, the DRAMs are much uh, much less expensive, comparatively speaking. So, so if you take these these same architectures and look several years down the road, what do they look like? What changes on the memory? What changes on the architecture itself? So right now, uh, speed and bandwidth is, is what's driving these. And, and so GDDR, as I mentioned, is 16 gig. But before, again, before this even goes into manufacturing, uh, DRAM manufacturers are talking about 18 gig. They're talking about 20 gigabits per second. So really just driving the, the, uh, the maximum uh, speed of this memory system. And so I think that we haven't even started scratching the surface there. So I, we have a, lot, a, long, a long way to go with this particular architecture. Similarly, with HBM, we're seeing the same thing. So HBM is a two gig standard right now, two gigabit standard, but already uh, there's, there's talk uh, in um, standardization committees of going 2.4, 2.8, 3.2 uh, gig with the current generation. And then there's talk, of course, of the next generation HBM3, which would maybe even change the addressing and give, give uh, you know, further uh, expansion of that memory system. So both of these are not standing still. They're going to continue to drive to, to try to keep up with that processor bandwidth. Can we keep up with the flow of data? So the amount of data that's increasing, will these kinds of architectures keep up with that, that amount of data? Well, like I said, we've still, they still have a long way to go before they run out of steam. But uh, I think it's going to be a combination of both better uh, processor architectures to take advantage of the bandwidth in com on combination with the memory architecture improvements. That's right. So everything's really in motion in the, in the memory market. We've got these two types of memory. We've got new versions of this, but there are other types of memories coming in as well, right? Well, you've, you certainly have the traditional memories are not sitting still. You've got DDR4 that's going to continue to push forward into higher bandwidths. Also, LPDDR is kind of making a move out of the traditional mobile area. And so you've got speeds with LPDDR4 going up to 4.2 gig today. So there, it's getting actually the attention of some markets that are outside mobile and in networking and, and automotive. So all the memory systems understand, you know, the memory vendors understand they've got to continue to push these, these speeds forward to keep up with the, the bandwidth needed. So given all these options, is it always clear to people what they should be using or are they starting to get, run into so many different options that they don't know which way to go? That's exactly right. So they, the options are many and, and we're being, uh, as, a, as a Phi vendor, we're being asked to help with those choices because as you can see, you know, there's, there's, you know, this is exact same equivalence from a system performance, but there's, there's significant trade-offs from cost from bandwidth, from, uh, excuse me, from cost from the um, uh, system complexity. And, and we've got to help with the uh, customers to kind of make those choices. So you've got a lot of memory options, but you also have a lot of architectural options which are starting to emerge. So analog may be split off from the digital in, in what you're, you're dealing with there on a two and a half D uh, where you may run analog at uh, 130 nanometers and your digital logic may be at seven nanometers. What happens on the memory there? Yeah, so as you, as you mentioned, as we move into some of the advanced process nodes, the analog doesn't always scale as well. So from a physical layer standpoint, whether, you know, regardless of the process nodes you're running, you, you don't necessarily get advantages. So what we're seeing is, is also some, uh, we could, might even want to think of it as disaggregation of the chips, where you're taking uh, your previous, you may have a, an analog chip either with a CERTES or a memory system that's in an older technology and you leave that on what's called like a chiplet and then you can kind of split your processor, or, you, or excuse me, you can split your SOC and then you can have interfaces on your SOC, the either, either high speed 
parallel interfaces or high-speed uh, serial interfaces that connect these chiplets together. This way, you have when you have a technology mismatch between a um, you know say an adva advanced node and maybe a slightly older node, you have ways for these chips to communicate, and you kind of bridge the gap between between those uh, technology nodes. Frank Farrell, thanks for a great explanation of what's going on in memory architectures. Thank you, Ed. It's good being here.